That's it, yeah. This is it. Or the fish wait <laughs> before they go in their tanks. Yeah. It depends if they're alive or not. <laughs> You know, if there's one area that is changing very quickly in technology, it's the ability to capture images. As human beings, it's one of the most important things. Our eyes, without those, it would be a very different life. Technology is allowing us to capture it easier, better, and quicker, to distribute it, to organize it, and to store it. Dave Chalk Connected is brought to you by TELUS. The future is friendly. Where will it be in five years? I think it's about the devices then, a device that allows us to take pictures or video wherever we are, store it easier and distribute it easier. So it might be something we carry on us, it might be a chip that transfers from device to device, but we're getting to the point where the quality is all we need. I mean, our eyes can be tricked quite easy. We're, we've got good quality pictures. Now it's about connecting and distributing. All right, we're, we're supposed to be rolling here. What's going on, Mark? Uh, the camera's not reacting well to all this humidity. Okay. Yeah, we'll try a small camera and hopefully this one will work well for us. Right. You know, just walking through the aquarium, it makes me realize I don't get out here often enough. There are some wonderful scenes and memories to be captured. Obviously, one of the reasons I want to take my digital camera with me there's something about digital cameras and the immediacy of the image. That memory is captured, and you know you've got the exact shot that you wanted to capture. While we know the digital camera is easy to use, there is much more that can be done with it to take advantage of it. Most of today's digital cameras have all the features I'm going to talk about. One of the first is the mode. While we set our camera on automatic and look around and take the picture, we can adjust it and put it in what is called an action or sports or outdoor or weather mode. Simply look at the menu on the back or refer to your owner's manual and you'll see that if you are in an indoor environment, a water scene, a snow condition or a sports environment, the camera will automatically adjust some of the settings to get you that perfect picture. What these automatic presets are really doing is configuring the camera for aperture and exposure. The nice thing about the camera is if you practice with them, you can control these yourself to do some very creative shots. Now the exposure is about how long the lens stays open for. If the lens stays open for an extended amount of time, it's a great way to get an interesting blur on something as it goes by. Or if you're in a low light condition, it's a way to let extra light into the camera to make sure you get a good shot. Now if you make the exposure time very short, it means very little light comes in, but it's great for getting the action shot, possibly a bird flying through here or something that's moving very quickly on the ground. Now the other interesting control is the aperture, usually indicated by an A on the top of the camera. By dialing this down and having a smaller aperture setting, you will see that the actual iris, which is the amount it opens up when the picture is taken, is smaller. Interestingly enough, when you use a small setting here, it actually allows you to get a very good depth of field, meaning things far off in the distant are clear. When you make that larger, it blurs out the background. And as you can see very quickly, some of the shots you have seen in magazines that have that blurry background but an in-focus up front are done by making the aperture setting larger. Now, those are two of the controls. A couple of other ones you need to know about on a digital camera that really make a big difference is white balance. You know, when you're outside under natural sunlight or in a room like this with artificial light, white looks very different. By setting the automatic white balance on the camera, it allows the camera to do a calculation to see what white is in the conditions you're in. When you take the picture and view it, you'll see that the white and therefore all the other colors matched exactly what you saw. Very important thing, but often overlooked. The next thing is, how much information you're going to collect about that picture and that we refer to picture quality your camera will typically be set up in a good better best mode two things are happening here in the lower mode we're getting less information and we're compressing it more these are great for pictures you might use on the web or just for a quick calculation or a quick injection into a document you're putting online if you're looking for the best as in good better best you're collecting a lot more data and you're using less compression which also means there's going to be a lot more information packed onto your memory card quicker, meaning you're not going to be able to take as many pictures. Typically, the camera will do a calculation and show you how many pictures. But there's nothing wrong with varying between shot to shot. This one, going to be used for email. 
lower it down. This one, very important picture. I'm going to print in an 8.5 by 11. You want to make sure you're getting in your best. You need a 3 to 5 megapixel resolution, as low compression as you can get to print that out as best you possibly can. And one other interesting setting that is often overlooked is the macro mode, usually indicated by a little flower on your camera. What this means, if you want to get a really close-up shot, allows you to go very tight on something. It actually adjusts the depth of field of the viewfinder, meaning you can only focus in a short distance like this. But the end result is absolutely amazing. You'll get one of the best shots close-up you could imagine by putting your camera into macro mode. Now I'm going to take a little bit more of a walk through the aquarium, and I've got some great tips for you coming up on how to best get the pictures you want from your digital camera. While digital cameras are amazingly configurable, the bottom line to remember is they're simply point and shoot. Have your digital camera with you. Remember when you buy one, get one small enough that you're going to be comfortable carrying wherever you go because you can take as many pictures as you want. Just a couple more tips for you when you do use your camera. Be careful with the flash. First off, digital cameras don't respond well in low light, so try and get outdoors for a lot of your pictures. Be careful with the flash because it can flare the shot. But one good time to use a flash on a camera is if the subject has the sun behind them. The flash works well to take the shadows off their face. Also, get close. And if you think you're close, get even closer. Get right up to the subject. You'll get some amazing shots, and you'll only know if you try. And be steady with the camera. Lock your arms to your side or put the camera on a tripod. Some of those wonderful shots that don't look perfect simply, you just moved a little bit when you took the picture. And one final thing. For features on the camera, sepia and black and white do wonders to really give imagery to the picture. They make you think, well, this was taken a long time ago, and, and stir up the emotions inside of a person. Remember, though, too, you don't have to use those features on your digital camera because when you import them to your computer, most of the software will allow you to make the adjustments. It's up to you to make the decisions. Bottom line is, remember to keep your digital camera with you. You can take lots of pictures. But remember, when time passes, the one thing that you will cherish most is those pictures that you took today. I think for first-time digital camera owners, uh, a few things. Uh, actually read the instruction manual because there's a lot of useful things in there about exposure and, and flash settings, truly. And just make sure you have a big enough memory card, too. Memory's so cheap now. You can get uh, a one gigabyte card for, you know, around $100. And that way, you're never going to worry about running out of room on your memory card. You can take hundreds of pictures before you have to offload them on your PC or, or have them printed. Yeah, we're looking yeah. for the Sony. Did you put it? Oh, you put yeah, it away. Oh, okay. it, it does a hybrid record mode. Got it. They're very curious about the camera, so we're going to try to keep the camera out of the way, and then when we bring the camera out, they'll come down here and check it out. What a wonderful place to visit and take pictures, the aquarium. You know, so often we forget to bring our cameras along. Ever since I got my digital camera, it really changed me. I take so many more pictures now. If you're still considering getting a digital camera and haven't quite jumped over that divide, there's a whole new reason to buy one, a whole new concept in hybrid digital cameras from Sony. It's called the DSC-M1, and it is a hybrid multimedia camera. This is it right here, a sleek, low-profile, 5.1 megapixel camera that really does do something different. It captures video along with the still image using MPEG-4 encoding, so he calls the MPEG Movie 4 TV, even being one of the first to record in stereo audio. It allows you to capture high-quality video and a digital image at the same time. The way you're going to understand this best is if I show it to you. Take a look here. In the aquarium just a minute ago, I captured this. The still image and the continuation of the video. You get about five seconds of video in front, the image is captured, and then three seconds of video trailing. That image that is captured is a 5.1 megapixel image, which is great for printout in 8.5 by 11. Now, the thing I really like about this is many times when I look back at old photographs and I'm looking at one thinking, hmm, I wonder what really happened just before and after this picture was taken. 
Well, that mystery is finally solved with this camera. The file sizes are so small, they're great for emailing, and they can even be played back on the TV. The lens in the camera is great, too. It's a Vario Tessar, one of the better ones by Carl Zeiss, with a three times optical zoom. As you can see, too, there's an actuating screen. It turns a full 270 degrees and perfect even for playback by flipping it around to the back side. It has a one gigabyte memory card in it right now, and if it was just video alone, that's going to be 54 minutes of video to be captured. As you can see, in wonderful places like this, it's so much nicer to capture more than just the still. Knowing you've got a 5.1 megapixel image is great, but knowing what happened just before and just after is a whole new way to capture memories. Appreciating the pictures is a really important thing, obviously, about taking digital pictures. I think in today's world, we're so infatuated with instant gratification, and we think we necessarily need to do something with our pictures as soon as we take them. I think it's important to put them on your hard drive, back them up on a DVD, that's the only thing that's going to have enough capacity, but it's in the years to follow, two, three, five, six, ten years from now, when you're going to really appreciate the pictures like always. You don't have to do anything with them right away. We ended on, we ended on, we ended on I, I like computers, but I, I like the gadgets. I like things that are hybrids. Like, I like the idea of, like, you know, smartphones. That's kind of an interesting concept. Uh, any kind of wireless device that does something intelligent. I mean, a Bluetooth air set which I finally started using, um, you know, after all these years, has, has really increased my productivity. I like it. It looks kind of geeky to put it in. Of course, I think I have it right now. But I'm going to say that traditionally, you get 150 feet. Yeah, the blue one's more important. Oh. Two steps back, and I saw the full picture of what was about to happen. This is my moment. As soon as Mike, as soon as Mike stops, every second, I'll be in front of it. Ready? Yeah. yeah. Let's uh, get that smart. Oh. And in three, two, and... Now, if you are spending more time outdoors and going to take your digital camera with you, you want to make sure you get one that is at least water resistant. Although a friend of mine had one water resistant, dropped it in the lake, fished it out, and it still worked. You don't want to dive with a camera like that. I want to show you something exciting here. This is a, a, a camera out of the U.S. right now called by DXG. It's only around $150 U.S. It's a 3.3 megapixel, lots of features, but it also includes the underwater case. Now, with many manufacturers, this case could be two to $300. Just for the case alone. Just for the case alone. Snap this inside. Now, this is great if you're into kayaking, windsurfing, skiing, any high adventure. This is a little bit of a buffer for the case. Gives you access to all the buttons on the outside. You can still see the uh, viewfinder in the back, and it's got an eyepiece in there that allows you to sync up with it. And it takes great shots underwater. So you don't have to invest a ton of money. This is a way to get a good camera. But again, I'm shocked that they included the case with this one, too. Super cheap. And again, if you look at these plastic housings for other cameras, they can range anywhere from three to $500 just for the case alone. This camera here has got a uh, built-in 16 megabyte uh, memory card, but it does take the SD card so that you can upgrade and right. get Right, and those more are pictures. the very, very small memory cards. And those cards are available all over the place. So the idea here is camera that can be used on land, take it with you. We've got our uh, fish tank with our little friend Pixel swimming around in there. Why don't we uh, do the test and make sure that it, it does work? And that's what it floats too. Perfect. Well, there's a blast from the past, the removable disc. Three and a half inches. The original ones were five and a quarter and they were called floppies because they were actually quite flexible. Those original ones only held about a tenth of a megabyte. Compare that today with modern computers that can hold in areas of 250,000 megabytes on a single drive. We've, we've come a long way. Why would we be interested in looking at one of these? Well, there's a lot of legacy systems out there. A lot of large companies, government and organizations, and even home users have a lot of archived information on these old disks. Try and read one, almost impossible, because none of the new computers nor notebook computers ship with a three and a half inch drive. However, there is a solution from Targus. If you do find the necessity to read one of these, a low-cost solution that's really easy to configure. This is their slimline external floppy disk drive. You can see it is quite slim. So if you did have to travel with this, it wouldn't take up that much room. And it has a USB connector, so that's it smart. works in all the, uh, the modern computers. Also works both on the Mac and the PC. And it's a plug-and-play drive. So once you plug it in, it'll automatically be detected. And you can even see on these Mac computers here, 
you simply plug the floppy disk drive in in a second, it'll automatically pop up an icon. And it is USB 1 and 2 compliant as well. About $70, not something you're going to need all the time, but if you do come across a situation where you have to read an old disk for some reason, you'll know that Targus has a solution for you. I've got, I've got a camera phone. I had one of the first in the market. And to tell you the truth, they're pretty cool. There's certain instances where having a picture and emailing it off right away is handy. I think we need better camera resolution. Obviously, that's here. Give me a uh, three megapixel to five megapixel camera phone, and I'll be a pretty happy camper. But I just need to know where this one's going to be used. Nick? Yeah, it's a DVD digital starter kit. OK, I'm good. Let's go. It's kind of funny because most of today's talk about cameras is about digital. We tend to forget the past so quickly, but flash back the camera a couple of years to the 1960s. This is what you would have wanted to get under the Christmas tree. It's an original brownie by Kodak. This is the camera that really revolutionized picture taking in the home. Sold for about $12, even in today's uh, increased dollar value, probably about $50 to $60 for the camera. This one still works. What made it great was the family could use it, and it took, well, what were considered great pictures. These are two of them right here. I don't know if they're considered great. Well, certainly the content is. This is uh, Tristan, or one of them was. This one right here, one of the gentlemen on our set. When he was about 10 years old. You can see a couple of things. These pictures have faded, but to tell you the truth, the major reason for the fade here is the film wasn't developed right away. It sat in a drawer for a couple of years and was then developed, and this is the sort of thing that can happen. In today's digital world, we don't have any of these problems. Our pictures are taken perfectly right out of the gate. We can use them in many different ways. So let's flash the uh, time window forward a few years and take a look at where we are today. If you want state-of-the-art picture taking well above what this camera was, you're about $1,000. We're going to show you one now that has all the features you need for under $1,000, around the $900 price range, that will make you look like a professional. This is from Canon. It's called their G6, part of their power uh, shot line. And this is made for serious photo enthusiasts. It's got a lot of great automatic features, so you just can simply point and click but it also has an immense amount of manual control, so you can really get down to the nitty-gritty. As far as the LCD screen, you can uh, actually use it like a regular digital camera. Let me just turn it on here. Have the screen right on the back. You can also flip it out, and this is nice if you're going to be taking photos, kind of like a camcorder mode, or if you're going to be trying to crowd. take in a crowd. Exactly, and get the down low shot here of Dave. Plus, you can even flip it around if you're really uh, vain like myself here and take yeah, self-portraits if you don't have any friends. A couple of other nice things about this one, it uses compact flash memory. Now, the nice thing about compact flash, it's one of the lowest cost memories in the marketplace, and it's compatible with a lot of other devices, so you can all afford to get a lot of the memory. A couple other quick things on it, what I like is the setup of this. It's very much modeled after a 35 millimeter camera that we're used to holding in our hands. The zoom on it is good, four times optical, which gives you the 35 millimeter to 120 millimeter, 140, 140 which is very uh, indicative of what your standard 35 millimeter would have been. The controls and dials are angled on the top, very easy to use. Got a hot shoe right here, which means you're going to get professional light attachment up on the top of it. And the focus, this is something to look for in the digital cameras. This has nine fields in its view, meaning if I'm zooming or taking a picture of something across the way and my subject isn't exactly centered in the lens, it'll make sure focusing is done accurately around the edge. And of course, what makes you really look like a professional is preset modes. This one has 12 of them. So while you're still learning the camera and not totally confident of setting up the aperture and all the other settings that go along with it, you can let the camera do it for you and you'll really pick up the great shots. It takes really uh, great quality images as well. Did we say seven? Seven. Seven. Here, here's what you get out of a 7.1 seven, 7 7.1 megapixel, megapixel camera. Take a look at that. This is when you're getting up to the 8.5 by 11. These are really high resolution. You can see the detail on this rose. And, and around 7, you've got all the resolution you need. Well, people always ask, do you really need that many megapixels? Well, you do if you're going to blow up images right. or if you're going to crop images. Maybe you've taken a large scene, but you want to zoom yeah. in on a particular person. And that is a real key thing. Let's say, for example, you've taken this shot here, but you'd really like to use this portion of the rose. You can now, with a 7 megapixel camera, go in, clip that, reprint it again in this size or maybe blow it back up and still have a pretty good picture from it. It's also got a built-in image processor so you can take the pictures quickly. That's one of the things, you know, with older digital cameras that didn't take them fast enough. Now you can click away with this. And it's also got special scene detection. Believe it or not, this camera has a built-in database of thousands of different 
scenery images. So now when you're taking pictures, it'll automatically reference those to make sure that you've got the best quality picture. And it's kind of cool because if it's a flower, if it's a scene, if it's a building like this, it uses its database to tweak the image. So as a final word, if you're still using your brownie and you want to step up a little bit here and you are looking for professional quality imagery, take a look. A lot of wonderful cameras out there. And cut. Cut. You got it. Good. Very nice. Beautiful. I think in the next five to ten years, digital photography is going to take some interesting turns. I think you're going to start seeing uh, the line blur between video and digital stills. I think the quality is going to be good enough on the video and memory is going to be so cheap that you're just going to be recording video all the time and you'll just take stills from the video. Dave Chalk Connected is brought to you by TELUS. The future is friendly. For someone first getting a digital camera, the best thing you can do is take lots of pictures. Take hundreds. Click it, press the button, turn the knob, change the dial, up close, go close, go super close and take a picture. Try the automatic settings, try the preset settings, and then try the manual settings. Experiment, because those pictures don't cost you anything. And in fact, when you first get something new, you've got the energy and the excitement about trying it. That's the best time to do it. Get all of the uh, complex things out of the way, find the things you like best, and then run with those. But you've got a window of about a week where you'll really be passionate about trying it. Try everything. Uh, last time I used my camera phone, who I probably shouldn't say, it was quite a while ago. You see, the thing is, I know I've got it with me, and if I really need to take a picture, I can do it. Have I done one recently? No. Uh, the last thing I took a photo of, uh, friends that we had over on the weekend. Hot tub party. I didn't, I didn't bring the camera into the hot tub. But. So you have lots of hot tub parties? Who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs>